welcome to the second in our series of talks on Julian of Norwich called Visions of Salvation. Now we turn to chapter 25, where we find Julian's account and reflections on the 11th showing of her revelation of divine love. The scene hasn't changed very much. Instead, Julian's focus has moved from Christ's wounds to the person of Mary. It's a wonderful and tender section of her text, which is really worth lingering on and exploring for what Julian says, not only about the person of Mary, but how she reflects back to us the hidden reality of our relationship with Christ and how we can fully respond to his love. So let's hear it now. And with this same expression of gladness and joy, our good Lord looked down on his right side and brought to my mind where Our Lady stood during his passion. And he said, Would you like to see her? And as if he had said with these sweet words, I well know you would like to see my blessed mother, for after myself she is the highest joy that I could show you and the greatest delight and honour to me, and it is she that my blessed creatures most desire to see. And because of the exalted marvellous special love that he has for this sweet virgin, his blessed mother, Our Lady St Mary, he showed her highly rejoicing, which is the meaning of these sweet words, as if he had said, Would you like to see how I love her? so that you can rejoice with me in the love that I have for her and she for me. And also, for greater understanding of these sweet words, our Lord God speaks to all mankind who will be saved, as though to one person, as if he said, Would you like to see in her how you are loved? For love of you I made her so exalted, so noble, and of such worth. And this delights me, and I want it to delight you. For after himself, she is the most blessed sight. But I was not taught by this to long to see her bodily presence while I am here, but the virtues of her blessed soul, her truth, her wisdom, her love, through which I may learn to know myself and reverently fear my God. And when our good Lord had revealed this and said these words, Would you like to see her? I answered and said, Yes, good Lord, thank you. Yes, good Lord, if it be your will. I prayed for this very often, and I expected to see her bodily presence, but I did not see her like that. And with those words Jesus, Jesus showed me a spiritual vision of her just as I had seen her small and simple before. So now he showed her high and noble and glorious and pleasing to him above all other created beings. And he wishes it to be known that all those who delight in him should delight in her and in the delight that he has in her and she in him. And for greater understanding he gave this example. If a man loves someone uniquely above all other creatures, he wants to make all creatures love and delight in that creature whom he loves so much. And after these words that Jesus said, Would you like to see her? seemed to me that the seemed to me the most pleasing words about her that he could have conveyed to me with the spiritual vision of her which he gave. For our Lord gave me no revelation about any particular individual except Our Lady St. Mary, and he showed her three times. The first was as she conceived, the second was as she was in her sorrows at the foot of the cross, and the third was as she is now, in delight, honour and joy. As we begin this section of our quartet of showings, 
It seems that we have moved seamlessly from one chapter to another, from one revelation to another. It's as if we are watching a film without cuts. The focus is exactly the same as that of the 10th revelation. We're still arrested by the countenance of Christ, which is full of joy and mirth. But Julian shifts the background to that countenance. In a rather disorientating way, we have been taken into the wounds of Christ, then back out again to the foot of the cross and the outpouring of blood and water from his side, then in again to the cloven heart and through this to the ecstatic soliloquy of love, which has made our hearts and faces shine with the same joy and mirth of the Lord as if we were Moses emerging from the presence of the Lord on Sinai. Now we shift once again, still with our eyes on Christ looking down to his right side. But now we follow his gaze to the foot of the cross and the person whom he is looking at, Mary. To be honest, it's been a bit of a roller coaster of a ride in perspective and worth just pausing to reflect on how Julian's text has managed to capture that disorientation and overwhelming sense of her visionary encounter. She's been able to express this perfectly in the way her writing has shifted through various forms of seeing and knowing and understanding. Ideas which are brought to mind overlay the showing and then move to understanding which undergirds the text. So we have moved through a mixture of colours and shades of expression that bring us through a prism to the white light of encounter ourselves, and where the countenance of Lord is able through her writing to be reflected in us. It's probable that Julian or a scribe added the chapter headings and demarcation of the text into chapters only at a later date to give some sense of structuring and signposting within her writing. Before this, it's easy to imagine that the written word enabled the visions to flow in Julian's mind from one to another just as they unfolded to her in a single revelation of divine love. So the 11th is not so much a separate scene in a tableau of events, but more a continuation of what has gone before. That's why reading the text as a whole is so important and valuable, because Julian's thoughts and language build and mould and transmute what has gone before. We see this as we move into the 11th revelation. The countenance of the Lord is the fulcrum to these two visions. It is this countenance which looks down into his wound. It is this countenance that the Lord wishes to impart to us. And it's this countenance that brings to mind the image of Mary at the foot of the cross. Devotion to the person of Mary was prevalent and profound during the 14th century. Central to this devotion was the image of the soaring mother Mary at the foot of the cross of Christ. It not only dominated the interior of local parish churches and cathedrals, but adorned the walls and refracted the light through stained glass windows. This devotional image also filled manuscripts of Gospels, Missals and the Book of Hours, books for public and for private use. While lyrics and passion meditations explored what Jesus' last words to his mother might have been how she felt seeing her son die and what she said at that most distressing of times. From dignified grief 
To collapsed agony, Mary epitomized the human suffering, the human response to the suffering of Christ on the cross. Like her son, she too called forth compassion for her sorrows and increased identity among the devout. With those who had watched Christ hundreds of years previously. One example of this devotion and the power of its expression in illumination can be seen in this exquisite Sherburn Missal. It was commissioned by Robert Bruning, who was abbot of the Benedictine Abbey of St Mary's in Sherburn from 1385 to 1415, and so we can date it to around the time that Julian was alive. The Missal was an important manuscript for all medieval churches and monastic houses to own, as it contained the prayers, text and calendar required for celebrating the Eucharist, as it does today. Being such an important book, it was therefore highly valued, and if the church or foundation was rich enough, was often highly decorated. So it was not surprising that the manuscript became an act of devotion in itself. We see this in the Sherburn Missal, which is made of the high, to the highest standards and full of exquisite illuminations. It was not only a working book, but also a piece of devotional art through which the community was to meditate and pray. The page which precedes the climax to the Mass, the Eucharistic prayer, is dominated by this image of the crucifixion. Christ looks down to his right, just as Julian imagines, and his eyes are barely open in agony. There is no cheer of gladness here, rather a meditation on the suffering of Christ on the cross. The scene is populated by many people who seem to jostle to be seen by the person looking at this image. One of them, is a rather in a rather nonchalant manner, sticks the lance into Christ's side and outpours the blood of the wine of the Eucharist. While Christ is central to this image, as one would expect, in order to reflect the sacrifice of the Eucharist, he does not dominate the composition of the piece. Instead, it is Mary, wrapped in azure blue, who swoons at the foot of the cross. It is clear that she is the one to whom the artist wanted our eye to be drawn and to be held. The reason for this may be that as the abbey was dedicated to Mary, that this image is to honour her. But this composition of the passion scene also expressed another seminal aspect of devotion to Mary in the late 14th century. At this time, many of the images of Mary and devotions to her included stories of her life, which went into great detail about what happened to her and especially how she coped with watching her son die. These embellished through imaginative meditation the slim scriptural account and enabled ordinary people to identify with her and through her intimate relationship with her son to identify with him. This devotion can be found to have its source in chapter 19 verse 26 to 27 where John writes Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. This passage may not mention the grief and agony of Mary in seeing the suffering of her son, but it does encapsulate the sense 
that on the cross Christ gave his mother to us. Not only to be the mother of the beloved disciple John, but also of all the disciples that came after. So the 11th revelation moves quickly from the idea of Mary at the foot of the cross, which the showing brought to mind for Julian, to Christ asking Julian if she would like to see Mary, as if she was her own mother. It is Christ who has shifted Julian's focus in the showing away from the passion narrative and meditation tropes to the notion of encounter, not with Christ, but with his mother Mary. Jesus' words are full of tenderness, like a child who is proud of his mother and wants you to be so too. But there is a greater significance to this language of affection. For the vision does not want us simply to delight in Mary, as if she were our own mother, but also to realize that Christ's relationship with her reveals how he looks and loves all who will be saved. He says to Julian, would you like to see in her how you are loved? The love song of the last showing has also shifted in its focus away from the love of Christ for the faithful to Mary, who epitomizes the perfect and fullest response to that love. Julian realizes that in this vision, Jesus is giving a lesson in love through the person of Mary. Numerous visionaries before her, not least Bridget of Sweden and Elizabeth of Hungary, as well as our own Marjorie, of Kemp, Marjorie Kemp, just up the road in King's Lynn, gave accounts of the visions and conversations they had with Mary, even to the extent of helping her bathe baby Jesus. But Julian realised that she was not going to be given such a vision, though she may have desired it. Instead, she received a spiritual vision of her blessed soul, her truth, wisdom, and her love, so that Julian may learn to know myself and reverently fear my God. Julian's visions of Mary were to enable her and us to learn and understand what the fullest and most perfect response to Christ's love is, that Mary reveals rather than focus on the life and person of herself. For it was Mary who responded absolutely to the love of Christ, so much so that they were united in love. In this 11th revelation, Julian sees Mary as high and noble and glorious which probably refers to either Mary's assumption or her coronation by her son as Queen of Heaven. Both were popular iconographical, iconographical subjects in the depictions of the life of Mary during this time. You only need to wander around some of the churches in Norfolk to find remnants of these devotional images. The crowning of Mary was seen as the pinnacle of the life of Mary, and Christ's words of delight and joy which this showing reveal in many ways encapsulates this culmination in her life. It's therefore not surprising that the 11th revelation also reflects this culmination. But for Julian, it is also the end stage in a journey through her visions. These have revealed that Mary's response to Christ's love is epitomized by her attitude, which she describes in terms of reverent dread. These two words, reverent dread, are not exactly terms we would associate with Mary or even sit well with us ourselves today. It sounds like an attitude which is rather oppressive and full of fear. 
not the intimate personal love between ourselves and God that the rest of her text seems to encourage and even to enable. So what do these words mean and how can they encapsulate that perfect response to Christ's love which Mary epitomizes? In chapter 74 of Revelations of Divine Love, Julian describes four different kinds of dread or fear that mark the soul's appropriate response to God. The first is dread of attack that wakes a person up from the sleep of sin. The second is dread of pain which turns the soul towards goodness. The third is doubtful dread, the worst kind that makes the soul doubt themselves and God's mercy. And finally, reverent dread, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in the soul. It is this last which mixes joy with respectful awe and trembling and causes the soul to realize the awesome nature of God. But it is also the stimulus which prompts the soul to flee from all that is not good, to know the littleness of its nature and abilities, and so run to the Lord's breast as a child into its mother's arms. This attitude of fear or dread or worshipful reverence for God also stops presumption and is described by Julian as the fair courtesy that is in heaven when one comes before the face of God. Mary is the icon of this elegant, deeply respectful and humble response to God, which she showed in her words to the angel at the Annunciation. It is as this simple maid and meek, young of age and little grown above a child, that she first makes an appearance in Julian's revelation. Once again, Julian does not have a bodily showing of her, but rather she comes to mind when Julian steps back from her first revelation and marvels that the Lord who is so reverent and dreadful will be so homely with a sinful creature living in the flesh. This first showing of the crown of thorns being pressed onto Jesus' head followed instantaneously with her heart filled with joy has brought to mind the truth and wisdom of Mary who responded just in this way to the news that the Lord who is so great and so awesome should be born of her who is a simple creature of his making. For both Mary and Julian it is the gift of this attitude of reverent dread which has enabled both Mary and Julian to respond and to receive Christ's love. In the exposition which follows in chapter 7, Mary is presented as the icon of the perfect response to God's invitation of love. Julian writes that the greatness of the beholding of God filled her with reverend dread, and with this she saw herself so little and so low, so simple and so poor in reward to her Lord God, that reverend dread filled her with meekness. And with this as her ground, she was open to be filled with grace and all manner of virtue, such as overpasses all creatures. Mary is the lesson of love for each of us. Mary continues to be an icon of the contemplative response to Christ, by which all Christ's lovers can relate and emulate. The next time she appears in the eighth revelation, where Reverend Dread, that littleness of the soul in comparison to the awesome nature of God, enables nothing less than unity with Christ in love. 
This is a dark moment in the showings as the vision lingers on the dying, thirsting Christ on the cross. Julian goes far beyond any passion meditation in her imaginative articulation of her vision. As her writing forces the reader to sit in the darkness at the foot of the cross and behold the slow dying of Christ without any relief. So hard is it to sit here that Julian begins to repent of ever asking for a vision of the cross in the first place until she realises that her pain at seeing the final death throes of Christ reveals just how much she loves him. She writes, How might any pain be more to me than to see him that is all my life, all my bliss and all my joy suffer? Here I felt truly that I loved Christ so much above myself that there was no pain that might be suffered less to that sorrow that I had to see him in. Once again, Julian's experience brings to mind Mary and how the greatness of her natural love and compassion as Christ's mother meant that she was united in love with him and so caused her the greatest of suffering. But this is true, not just of Mary, but is shared and known by all who greatly love Christ like Julian and like us. In each case, the experiences of Julian are clarified and understood when she is shown the figure of Mary, who reflects back to her and to us the vacation of all Christ's lovers. So finally, in the 11th showing, Mary appears for the last time honoured as sweet virgin, blessed mother and Our Lady St Mary. Now in the bliss of this presentation of her to us by Christ, we are shown how it was through her reverent dread that love could enter our world as a human being, pour his love into our hearts and unite us to him in love. We have suffered through his passion. If we have suffered through his passion, it is only because we, like all Christ's servants, will suffer in the measure of how we love.